All right, intellectual property at ASVRP, that's going to be the thrust of the presentation today because we are at the point in our evolution as an academic research organization where we are actually able to take principles, move them to publication and eventually to patents, patented status. All right, so what is IP? Here again is the formal definition. This is from the United States um, Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO. And I'll give you a second to look at them. But while you're doing that, I'll note that the USPTO governs intellectual properties that are developed and or uh, brought to patent status in the US only. And there is a separate patent office for the European Union. There is a separate one for uh, China has their own. I believe Japan is folded under the US. And so it's international patent status becomes very, very messy and convoluted when you get into it. Just it's worth noting that a patent granted under the USPTO has no standing other than what is informally agreed to by any other patent office in any other nation state. So I believe we have treaties with the EU that help that out a little. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, patents generally are one of the ways of protecting intellectual property. And so here's a real quick description of what intellectual property is. Um, intellectual property law states that no one should be given a monopoly on facts, ideas, or other building blocks of knowledge. And the principle that underlies this is by patenting or copywriting or trademarking intellectual property, it is done as part of the act of exposing it to the public domain, okay? And further, the patent office says that in order to be eligible for a patent, it must meet the criteria that it is not just an expression that's inseparable from the underlying idea. In other words, you can't patent any of the, the natural laws of physics, for example. All right, real quick, some of the different types of patents. Utility patent is probably the most commonly understood. It is a patent of a thing, an object. Uh, there are other patents that are roughly called design patents. You'll see them for the next two rows there. Design patent or plat plant patent as an example are two of the same thing. In other words, the process of generating a new design, a novel design is what is patented with a design patent. Copyright, trade secret, trademark, these are all different types of protection. Trade secret gets folded in underneath generally a trademark, but it can also become part of the underlying fundamental knowledge for a patent, okay? So types of IP, I'll let you read it. Trademark, patent, and copyright are the three main legs of uh, intellectual property protection, at least here in the US, in the EU, and most of the patent offices of the nation states that make up the, uh, at least what is loosely recognized as the uh, industrial nations. Okay, so trademark Kleenex, Coca-Cola, Thermo Fisher, all right, guarantees a specific identity um, and most of the litigation that goes on under this area is in somebody to some small degree changing a recognized trademark and then trying to, in effect, get some 
additional recognition by virtue of writing on the code, uh, what do you call it? Code strings? No. By association with the recognized trademark. All right. Patents, legal stuff used to be that the award of a patent and especially the decision in the case of uh, conflicting claims was given to the first to invent. The first to invent generally was what most of the research organizations insisted on keeping notebooks to, to demonstrate. And the patent office in cases of conflict or contradiction would go back to whoever could produce in writing in some substantive form the first idea of the particular patentable object. That was changed back in, Larry, I'm not sure if you remember, I'm trying to remember, 2013, I think, from first to invent to first to file. And first to file merely means that whoever has the earliest timestamp from the USPTO is the one that uh, generally can lay claim to the intellectual property that's being covered. This that's was the standard in the EU. And so we brought the USPTO into agreement with the EU. Go okay. ahead. That created a certain interesting situation uh, in that if someone created prior art before someone filed, it did not invalidate the patent, but it means that the person who proved prior art has right to use that IP for free without infringing on the patent. So you can look that Again, up under, under prior art. It has to be demonstrable again by virtue of a lab notebook or Word document or some other physical form of expression. There are the three types of patents again with notably the bottom one, divisional patent, the special case, um, regular patents generate, depending upon the object or the IP that is being patented, generate protection for seven or even as long as 20 years. 20 years is typical in a pharmaceutical industry. 20 years would be something that we would be most interested in in a number of cases. All right, the provisional patent only gives you protection for a year. But importantly, what the provisional patent does is it starts the clock. So go back up to first to file. If you have a provisional patent that predates the subsequent utility filing and your claims in your provisional patent are of sufficient strength that you can demonstrate that you have the identical idea and claims as the formal utility patent filing, you would probably win any kind of adjudication. But again, they're only protecting you for a year, so you have to continue to refile a provisional on a yearly basis in order to maintain that protection. It will theoretically give you a little bit longer protection than just the standard seven or 20 years. A design patent, I am not so sure, but I believe a design patent is also somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 20 years protection. All right, so we talk about claims. What are claims? The claims are the substantive descriptions that make up the body of the patent that have to uniquely identify the object that is being patented, uniquely identify the intellectual property and do it in such a way that 
any other person with a reasonable amount of expertise in the particular area of this IP would be able to reproduce the intellectual property that's being patented. So a patent needs to be very, very thorough and explicit when you describe claims and there's an example coming up in a second. Okay, but you can be too specific. Most often the main problem is being too general. And in fact, this is what occurred when I believe it was uh, Apple went after Microsoft for the look and feel of the desktop environment. And they were found that, or it was found that the description in the Apple filing was insufficiently explicit to prevent other vendors, Microsoft, Red Hat, Red Hat or Oracle from uh, designing their own desktop environment. So before drafting claims, you need to answer some questions and you don't need to do it formally, but you need to stop and think about it. All right, and here are those questions. They're not necessarily in any particular order, but for example, if you can't answer what the pieces and parts are of the invention, then you're not gonna be able to be explicit enough in your claims. If you're not explicit enough in your claims, then your patent is for all intents and purposes, not going to protect the intellectual property that you desire, okay? So again, like it says at the bottom, if you can't answer all of the questions, then stop, don't waste any more time. All right, so what does one look like? This is a single claim from a patent application. And it's a very recent one. This has to do with uh, uh, neuroinformatics, but this is just claim number one out of Oh, shucks. I was going to try and remember the exact number of claims, and I don't. Uh, 60 or 70 some, I believe, with sub clauses like you see here in the bullets. Okay. This is the kind of detail you need to go into if you want to create a patent. Other things, copyright, for example, a song. What are some of the rough costs? Here you are. Um, generally, if you're not doing a provisional patent, you can expect it to cost at least with fees and with the attorney's time, five to $10,000 at a minimum to file for a utility patent. I believe the same holds true for a design patent as well. Okay. So. It's not only about patents though. And one of the current areas that is under uh, some examination by the patent offices around the world that are at least cooperative is what to do, for example, about databases, okay? Databases are a very unique case. Databases as part of the current knowledge economy, which is the economy that is pretty much assumed to be in place today. Um, databases are dynamic entities. And so if you think back, if you file a patent and you have to be very explicit in your claims. As soon as that database changes, you've invalidated your, your claims and so the patent no longer gives you protection. So what is being done? Some approaches are to integrate or include the database itself as part of a larger application or design that you're going to seek a regular patent for. But it is a very thorny issue that is still being belabored. What does this mean for us? What is the main thing that ASDRP does? <clears throat> the main thing that we do is we generate data. 
and it is the data that serves as the foundation for any of the publications that we do and it is the data that will serve as the foundation for the development of any applications or objects that ensue from that data and from our analysis. But it does indicate that there is some additional thought that we have to do when we look at taking our intellectual property to the next state or the next step. So this is just a continuation of what was done on Saturday. For those of you that weren't there, I'm gonna breeze through it, but that seminar recording is in the YouTube channel for ASDRP somewhere. I don't know where. The point of this here is that there are multiple layers to, to security and protection of IP, not the least of which is legislated security on the part of not only nations, but also the individual states. And here's a good example of what's going on in the U.S. And you can look for yourself, but California is one of three states that has actually enacted legislation to protect intellectual property and protect the information as it relates to individuals. Okay, and each one of these different federal acronyms or different acronyms here underneath federal denotes a different type and class of information, all of which must be protected. Some of us are doing research at ASDRP that is going to involve either soliciting responses to surveys from some external parties to ASDRP, or we're doing research that involves data that has been accumulated from patients in the medical arena and which must therefore be protected according to either PHI or HIPAA standards. And those have consequences that begin not only uh, with the data itself, but in how we protect that data, including things as simple as being able to lock a door. And we'll get to that more here in a bit. Okay, so protection of IP is not always obvious. There are layers. This is a example of protecting corporate assets, but that company asset might as well be any organization like ASDRP. There are different types of security that you have to implement, and all of it, especially when we talk about medical databases has to ensure that there be some data privacy for the individuals um, who participated in the data collection that we're using for further study. So physical security, I'll let you read this, but it, it's not as obvious as it seems. It starts with being able to secure or lock doors and it continues on up through being able to um, if you will guard wiring connections, um, ensure that the radiation, the wavelengths of the radiation for the Wi-Fi, for example, can't be compromised. And so there are multiple threats that have been usual in data security, starting with things like man traps, which are just controlling access to the computer room. Uh, the best one I went through was uh, for Wells Fargo Bank's data center out in Roseville. And uh, it was uh, similar to this, except for it was a revolving door. And if you failed, it locked you in there until security got there. It was a palm reader, like what appears to be being used here. This up here, the 802.3 tap, this is just an example of a plug board where you're gonna be terminating either phone lines like this little section shows or ethernet cables and it controls the wiring plant within the building. This has traditionally been a target of data thieves 
in that they can get in and they can put a remora or a sometimes you'll hear it referred to as leeches on the same connection and they can just steal the signal as it goes across the wires from the punch block. And then down below is something called war driving, which is now brand new with Wi-Fi. Well, it was came into being with the advent of Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi has no boundaries. There is no physical transport medium. And so people would drive around and have a, a setup like you see here. And they just go and look for the SSIDs, the identities of the Wi-Fi networks, which are out in the ether around you. And in fact, one of the worst offenders is Google. And everybody's seen the Google cars that drive around getting your neighborhood views, all right? Google, at the same time, as this points out, was collecting the SSIDs of every Wi-Fi network that they encountered. And not only that, they were looking for ones that were unprotected because in an unprotected Wi-Fi network, they could also get passwords. And so this picture shows on the right here, a segment of it. It looks like this is sort of a research triangle or an industrial park with every single one of the Wi-Fi SSIDs identified here. Okay. So the only way to protect something like this that is non-physical in nature is to implement other protections. But what's the simplest measure you can take? Lock the darned doors. And in fact, um, we had an instance of this just yesterday where somebody left one of the doors unlocked for one of the labs in ASDRP. And in fact, it was for the dry lab where the computer cluster is. Uh, terrible exposure. I don't believe anybody compromised us. I took a look earlier today. But what it means is we've got to think about everything we do if we're going to protect our intellectual property. So we've got the physical aspects covered for you. We've got some of the Wi-Fi covered for you. But we depend upon you, the researchers. And the reason for that is that we have no control, no means of implementing what you see here, which is a standard in this particular case, Linux challenge and handshake authentication protocol and password authentication module protection scheme. And where this is a problem is if you take, whoops, let me back up. If you take the data and you put it on an SD card or you put it on a thumb drive and you remove that then from the machine that is within the boundaries, within the protection scheme of ASDRP, and you take it outside, you've now compromised all the data on there. I'd be willing to bet that the majority of you have at some point or another wandered around the labs in ASDRP looking for a thumb drive, for a USB drive to download the data, and you haven't been able to find one. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but Edward could probably share with us how many thumb drives we had at one point in time. Additionally, pardon the Bavarian theme in the background. Additionally, SD cards have a habit of disappearing from ASDRP, walking out the door. And if that's not bad enough, they're being left in people's pockets in their lab coats or and going through the wash. Now, that doesn't sound like anybody's going to compromise the data, but at some point or another, we're going to want to go back and get that data. And it doesn't exist because that SD card is now sparkling clean and unusable. Thumb drives have a habit of disappearing 
And so any time that they leave ASDRP, that's another exposure to IP. And the first question that a patent examiner is going to ask anybody who's seeking a patent is, has the data or have the ideas ever been in the public domain? And if they've been in the public domain, then your, your road is even further uphill to getting that patent granted. Go back, logical here are the protections that we put in place in ASDRP to lock the data down, uh, easy enough to do, but this is just, this is, I took a look, a snapshot at 3.30 this afternoon. All right, there'd been 8,000, 400 some exploits that have been stopped by just the firewall on our demarcation router. 543 out, nine a minute. And that that's a slow day, but it doesn't even give you any idea of the ones that got through. It got stopped by the cluster, the authentication mat module on the computer cluster itself. Um, I, I can show, if somebody wants to see later, I'll show the exploits in real time as they're hitting us. But like I said, today's kind of a slow day. So if you want to see it later on, let me know. But all of this protection that we put in place goes to waste if, for example, in Wi-Fi you use the wrong SSID or you let the portable storage, whether it's a thumb drive or an SD card, get out of your control. And that middle point there, using the Wi-Fi anywhere that they have free Wi-Fi, you may think it's protected, not necessarily. On more than one occasion, I've been able to sit in either a, a conference at a large in, industry meeting, for example, the IETF, which is the Inter International Engineering Task Force, is a standards body and just do the equivalent of war driving and watch login attempts go by with passwords, not always, but sometimes being in the clear. You need to think all the time. And anything that says it's open, like a Wi-Fi SSID and has this unlocked symbol next to it, bad news. Please don't use it. So what can you do? Here are some of the things. Watch the data, secure it, stay the heck off of social networks unless you're just talking about music or something, but don't mention the research you're doing in social networks. And even personal interactions I, I, nobody wants to suspect their family and probably nobody's family would with malice aforethought try and steal the idea that you're working on or the research you're doing at ASGRP. But as a parent myself, I'm more than willing to admit I love to brag about my kids. And I'm not thinking about the intellectual property that they're creating and sharing when I'm doing it. So if you're going to talk to your parents, hopefully they understand. You should be able to explain to them, I can only tell you about this in the most general terms, mom or dad, because what we're doing is going to eventually lead to a patent or it's going to lead to a copyright. And until those things are actually filed, I can't be more specific. And I'd, I'd be willing to say that any of us advisors at ASDRP who have experience with either copyright or patent would be more than willing to help you out if it comes down to it and explain just why we're being so, so sneaky and apparently non-communicative. If you run into a situation, let us know. We'll help you out. So... Security isn't only about theft. As I mentioned, SD cards, thumb drives, they disappear. External disk drives, USB drives, they get shared. All right. 
I'd be willing to guarantee that if you're using any of these, none of you has put any kind of password protection, much less encryption on the data that you're putting on these types of devices. Theft, yes, but spills, going into the wash, I'm sure we have one or two people here that are familiar with this. There are any number of exposures that we have to protect against because as I said, that SD card that's just gone through the washer may have had three months worth of experimental data on it that now has to be recreated because the data is gone. It's nowhere else. The instrumentation we have in the labs is all a very, very limited capacity. That's why you offload the data. And so let's be careful. Just take that extra second to take a thought. Am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing this? I put it on the SD card, but then I put the SD card on the bench, walked away because I wanted to get another hot pocket, come back. Oh, somebody spilled acid on it. Guess what? Your publication or whatever you're working on has now been delayed by the amount of time it's going to take to reproduce all that data, which is not a, an insignificant thing. Um, so what could possibly go wrong? Any kind of number of things, especially if you're out there uh, in social networks, probably the, well, this used to be true. I don't know if it is or not anymore. Facebook used to be the prime vector for phishing schemes, phishing with a pH, of bad actors looking to get the information that they need to compromise either your identity or IP. The latest, the most quickly, yeah, most quickly growing exploit today is ransomware. And that's what this bottom graphic is. And ransomware, they use phishing, they get a hold of the information they need, or they entice you to go to a site where you really shouldn't go. And they put malicious code on your machine. And then at some point that malicious code gets executed and it goes out and encrypts your entire hard drive. Or worst case, it encrypts every hard drive in the entire organization. And this is happening today. You can go and look at different ransomware attacks and exploits, right? And the way you get it back is you have to pay a ransom. That's why they call it ransomware. Well, guess what? The, the bad actors are learning from the people who made a business out of doing actual kidnapping and ransoming of individuals. And so now it's not only one payment, but as soon as you make the one payment, they get back and say, oh, you know, expenses have gone up. We're sorry to pass this along, but you know, we're going to have to ask for more. And the reason why you keep paying them is because they hold the key that can be used to decrypt all your encrypted data. And that key can be anywhere from 4,000 bits to there are some schemes that use keys that are megabits in size. There's no way you're going to recover from that on your own. You have to pay the ransom. And it wipes out everything. You are effectively your loss. Hospitals that have been hit by ransomware attacks have had to go back to paper records. And they essentially shut down all services except for the emergency room or the ICUs. Okay? Because guess what? It's been decades since anybody in a hospital had to use paper records. So be careful. Now, Miss Laney, at the end of this, all the references for the images, 
hopefully all of the references for the images, as well as for the sources that were used. Uh, you'll see the USPTO, uh, Google on behalf of the USPTO. All right. And then there, this one here, Information Systems in the Environment, excellent book. It's only about uh, 300 and some pages, I think. So if you want to get a hold of that, these are the card numbers for it. But there's a lot of information out there. Bottom line is we are doing significant enough novel research today in ASDRP that almost all of it at some point or another could lead to either patentable or copyright information. Okay. Don't take any risks. There aren't a lot of high school seniors that matriculate to four-year universities or colleges that have patents with their name on them. You want to differentiate yourself from your competition. That's a real striking way to do it. And if it's important to you that you get into a good school, well, guess what? It better also be important to you to take the appropriate precautions you need to take to protect the information that's going to make you a standout. So that, that's it. I'm done. And uh, time for questions. So the attendance form is in the chat window. It does contain um, a few questions that uh, gauge people's grasp of information? So I, I've seen things scrolling by answering questions in the chat room. I'm going to assume I don't have to look. Where can we access the recording? Uh, Annika, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Um, and maybe even a copy of the slides. Uh, sh sure, that can be done, yeah. yeah. So, no questions? So here's a question that anybody can answer. What's an example of intellectual property at ASDRP that you individually work with? You don't have to spill the beans on the recorded, you know, Zoom call, but what's an example of some sort of research work that you are involved in that is uh, involved in intellectual property? There's intellectual property of some sort. Caden? Um, wouldn't, like, code that we develop count as Good. that? Good. Excellent. It could, okay. yep. There better not be anybody from one of Ms. Janikia's groups here who hasn't any idea how to answer that question. Would the reports we published be an example of one? Okay, good. So pre-publication uh, data. Yeah, pre-publication Here's a better question. What protection would the pre-publication data come under? Trademark, patent, or copyright? Hmm. This is concerning. Yeah, I'm very much concerned. <laughs> Can I bring my glasses? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, they logged in and they're playing, uh, 
solitary. But at least we haven't had anybody come back and say, can you repeat the question, please? Can you repeat the question, please? No. I, those mini black hole people, I different bunch all together. I'm going to actually head off, uh, Mr. Dunn. All right, see you, bud. Yep. Um, I'm going to make Thanks. sure I fill out the form now. See ya. Some Bye. people are saying copyright. <laughs> I guess nobody cares that uh, they might be able to secure copyright or patent. Everybody must assume that they've got a lock on admissions. Or better yet, my college counselor didn't cover that. Mr. Downing and I have uh, strong opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Very strong opinions. Yes. So there's a question for you, Bob. If it was originally created work data, would it not fall under the category of copyright? Um, not necessarily, Landon. Okay. Uh, copyright pretty much covers an idea, whether that idea is expressed in writing or it's expressed in, for example, computer code. Whereas patents generally apply to or cover an object, a thing. But the caveat there is you can also patent a process which comes under design patent. Um, yes, copyright associated with digital work such as art and music. Also non-digital work. I mean, uh, I'm trying to remember one of the classical, classical um, composers is descendants finally relinquished their copyright protection for all of the music that he wrote within the last couple of years. Anybody else? No? Here's a here's an interesting point. Um, this is for mostly for the chemists out there. Um, but also for anybody else, this is related to something that Mr. Downing covered in one of the slides. Uh, is say there's a molecule that's produced in in nature, called natural product. And uh, and, and we synthesized it in the laboratory. We did the total synthesis of a natural product. Can you patent a natural product? Can you patent a molecule that you produced in the laboratory, but is identical to that which is found in nature? I think you can patent how you made it, but not, yeah. not the molecule itself. Great. Yeah. Good and, and, and why would you not be able to patent the actual compound if it's a natural product? Because you didn't invent it. Yeah, nature invented it, right? It's in the public domain, if you will. Uh, if you know, finding it under a rock or from a tree is in the public domain. Yeah, very good. That's that's excellent. You can patent a synthetic route, and in fact, synthetic chemists often do that. Okay, so how to make a molecule? You can patent. So if a someone, class. if someone were to. Uh, find a better or find a different methodology, they could patent their methodology. And they, you would have two competing methods of making the natural molecule. And if you use your methodology, they would have to pay royalties to you. And if somebody used somebody else's methodology, they'd have to pay royalties to them. That is correct. And Oh, by the way, you know, that is where a lot of legal battles are fought in medicinal chemistry, because how do you say two synthetic routes, two ways of making a molecule, 
are similar or dissimilar? Well, they're going to be similar to some extent because we're achieving the final target. But good. If, if, if you make a molecule that is not natural, can you patent that? I think you can. You can as long as it is a novel molecule. That's good. So if it's already been reported before in the literature, you cannot patent it. Good. Does anybody want to guess what, well, this is apocryphal or hearsay, but does anybody want to guess what the first objects were that caused the idea of patents to be codified or made into uh, legal entities? Art, chemotherapy, no, no, way, think further back. Wheels? <laughs> no. Tulips. They were busy creating different bulbs, different strains of tulips. And the tulip merchants needed protection from each other so that somebody else couldn't steal their, their design for a new tulip. And so it came, they came out of Copenhagen, I believe, first. This is back in the days of guilds and the early merchants. And so the first patents were largely design patents. Yes, as Ms. Janiki observes, patenting plants is a very hot topic. Roses are a current um, hotbed of activity. Uh, so are, um, oh gosh, orchids, I believe is the next, or it might be the most contentious right now. Different types of orchids. Good question there. Does anybody know why that is? Anybody want to make a guess? Uh, maybe genetically modified plants could be very valuable. But why? Because they could have certain traits that um, that make them, um, you know, favorable to grow. But they produce a lot of fruit. Yeah, these so. are valid. But this is a very important part. Like um, that is very simple, actually, because well, we can live without a software but we cannot live without food. So any kind of novel plants or uh, seeds um, that is sustainable for the future of our planet is something that you want to have it, you want to record it. If it's a specific plant is not growing uh, in XYZ area, if you can work with a different method, you can patent that method is just helping humans. Uh, life, right? So anything that is even giving uh, more value to humans' life, it's something that's very hot and valuable. We, we definitely can live without a software, right? But <laughs> not without food. Um, so that's why it's very important. Okay. Okay, last question. Uh, if you as a student are involved in a work that ends up um, being patented while you're here at ASDRP. Two questions. How does one, well, I guess first question is who owns that patent? 
And secondly, how does one end up as a co-inventor in that path? By the way, every one of you should know the answer to this because you signed a piece of paper that applies directly to the first question. Ah, Kevin. So I'll, in your check-in and in your virtual orientation, if you're brand new, you did your virtual orientation online. If, you, if, you're, if you're not new, you did that check-in process and you electronically signed an intellectual property statement. So the official position is that uh, intellectual property is the shared commonwealth of the institution, the advisor, and you, the student. That's pretty cool. You get to be a co-owner and a co-inventor on stuff that you help to produce and help to make happen. So what is the criteria then of being a co-inventor? Does everybody who gets involved in a publication also become a co-inventor in a patent? Yeah, so Safia has stated something very, uh, I think very good. The advisors, the owner, to be a co-owner, the researcher must contribute some no novel work slash functionality to the product. That's very good. That's very good. Good. I give them that answer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they were fed by you, Mark. I see how it is. Okay. Yeah. And folks, by the way, uh, all of us advisors can see your responses on the attendance sheet. And so now please listen up because some of these are a little depressing. So, right. Oh, so I should probably not even look. No. <laughs> okay, well, have a good evening. Did, did we want to talk about the... What's up? Oh, we yes. Want to so to issue? that end, don't leave yet. Yes, to that end. Uh, we we spent a good portion of Saturday morning, okay, Mr. Downing, myself, uh, Sahar, Larry was there, and Akira Yamamoto as well, and David Linifers, the whole bit, um, talking about this very thing, about intellectual property days, DRP. And we realized that all of, thank you, know, thanks in part to all of you, thanks largely to all of you and your hard work and efforts, uh, we're at a point in this institution where we're producing a lot of intellectual property. Um, and so being able to train all of you is important, not only for the sake of the intellectual property, but also for all of your benefit. You don't want to be in a position later on where uh, you've actually created something that might've been patentable, but oh, by the way, you can't patent it because it was shared on Facebook or something like that. Um, so there will be a little bit of intellectual property training. It will be kind of like lab safety training. It won't be quite as long, it will be quite short. It will be on Canvas and it will be required for all researchers. Uh, we'll, we'll probably get that to all of you later on this week and you'll have maybe a month to do it. Um, but that this sort of training is uh, absolutely uh, essential to the progress of science and to the continuum of research, which is a story that all of you are involved in. So yes, it is exciting. Some of you are like, how is an extra Canvas course exciting? Well, it is. It's exciting that all of you get to be part of this process. Great. Okay, have a great Tuesday evening. Next Tuesday, we will have a presenter. It's gonna be from my group um, and from, I think, Rob, we have a student and uh, one of Andrew's students is gonna be presenting. So we got a full, full panel, three presenters next week. So, full boat. Yes. Put on your seatbelt, make sure your rocket booster is strapped down tight, feed the frogs and jump across the river. <laughs>